Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Gene Crane and Glenn Langan in Margie. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. For me, and I think probably for you, the memories of high school are the gayest, pleasantest, and most nostalgic of all. And tonight, in that nostalgic vein, we take you back to 1928, a year of raccoon coats, flagpole sitters, miniature golf, and rumble seat romances. A crazy, colorful, romantic period that forms the backdrop of our play from 20th Century Fox's screen hit, Margie. You'll meet the original stars, Gene Crane as Margie and Glenn Langan, one of Hollywood's most promising young leading men in his first appearance on our stage. Many things have changed since the flaming 20s of our play, but one fashion that still prevails is Lux Soap for complexion care. Even in 1928, it was the beauty soap of film stars. And while the Lux Radio Theater had yet to be born, the early popularity of Lux Soap was, I'm sure, already laying the foundations for this, the greatest national theater in the world. It's curtain time, and here's act one of Margie, starring Jean Crane in the title role and Glenn Langan as Mr. Fontaine, with Jane Darwell as Grandma and Barbara Lawrence as Mary Bell. <laughs> It's a rainy Saturday afternoon, and in the attic of a pleasant little house in a pleasant little town, a young mother and her teenage daughter are rummaging through a dusty collection of trunks and boxes. The daughter has discovered an old phonograph and a carton of records. Can you imagine, Mother? The phonograph actually still works. Well, after all, dear, it's not quite an antique yet. You used to have to wind this thing every time you wanted to play a record? Oh, we put up with a lot of hardships in those days. My goodness, will you look at these? Well, what are they? Just an old pair of bloomers I used to wear when I was about your age. Gee, they're hideous. I mean, well, they're so bulky. Well, they were quite a problem now and then. Mother, tell me all about the crazy and idiotic things you did when you were my age. Well, I went to Central High School, just like you were doing. Well, tell me about it. Tell me about some simply terrific event that happened in your life. Well, I'm not so sure a terrific event in 1928 will seem so terrific to you in 1947. Oh, Mother, now you're just being difficult. Well, let's look at my old photograph album. Now, here, this is a picture of Johnny Green. What's that thing he's wearing? Why, a raccoon coat, of course. He was the only boy in school with a raccoon coat and a Stutz Blackhawk. A what? It was a kind of automobile, dear. You went for him, huh? Oh, I went for him all right. But it was Mary Bell who had him hogtied. Mary Bell? She used to live next door to us. Well, one day after school... Hiya, Mary Bell. Johnny, you're terrible. If you keep me waiting like this ah, again... Ah, banana I... oil. Get in the car. Oh, I, uh... I promised we'd take home Margie, too. Oh, for crying out loud. Do we always have to drag Margie McDuff along? Well, I can't help it. After all, she does live next door to me. Oh, boy, what a pain in the neck. Say, did you see the new French teacher? Yeah, I saw him. Is he good looking? His name's Fontaine. Look, if Margie doesn't show up in two minutes, we're going to have to go... Shh, shh, there she is. Uh, hi, Margie. Oh, hello, Mary Bell. Hi, Johnny. Well, come on, McDuff. Don't just stand there. I, I can't. Well, what do you mean you can't? Mary Bell, c c come here a minute. Oh, please. What's the matter? Mary Bell, please. Oh, just a minute, Johnny. What are you so flustered about? Not so loud. Huh? Do, 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 do you have a s s safety pin, Mary Bell? What do you want a safety pin for? The elastic in my bloomers. It just broke. I felt it. I think I've got one in my purse. Hey, what's the matter, McDuff? 
What are you standing so funny for? Take him away. Oh, please take him away. Here's the safety pen. Uh, you want us to wait for you? No, just go on home. And if you dare tell Johnny Green what's the matter, I'll kill you. Oh, I won't. Uh, goodbye, Margie. Well, where's she going? Well, Margie just decided to, uh, uh, to wait for something. Oh, what's she waiting for, the fall? Oh, Johnny, you're a scream. You don't know how funny that is. Here I am, Margie. Hey, Margie. Roy. Gosh, I'm glad you waited for me. Uh, how come you didn't go home with Mary Bell? Oh, because I didn't, that's all. What's the matter, Margie? Anything wrong? Oh, Roy, hey, I was... you I... shouldn't do that. What? Go around with safety pins in your mouth. I knew a kid once who swallowed a safety pin. Roy, and... I wish you'd go home. Can't I go home with you? No, I, I've got some things to do in the library. Okay, I'll go with you. No. Well, what are you walking so funny for, Margie? Uh, anything I can do? Yes. Go home and don't bother me. Well, gee whiz. Okay, okay. Oh, hello, Margie. H hello, Miss Palmer. I have those books for you for your debate. Oh. Oh, yes, the debate. Uh, can I pick them up in a minute, Miss Palmer? I want to go over there in the c corner. What's over there in the corner? I've got to hitch up. I mean, I I've got to catch up on my p political philosophy. Of course, dear. Run along. Oh, thank you. Oh, hello, Ralph. Well, how does our new French teacher like Central High? Well, so far, very much. But it's really surprising, Isabel. You should see my classes. Standing room only. I never heard of such a passion to acquire French. Girls, mostly, I suppose. Yes, yes, I believe they are in the majority of that. <laughs> You've been the talk of the school all day long. The girls think you're too darling for words. Oh, come on, now, Isabel. Cut it out. <laughs> Say, this is uh, quite a nice library you've got here. Uh, would you like a book? Yes, yes, I would. Help yourself, Ralph. We still trust the faculty. Oh, hello. <gasps> What's the matter? Oh, n n nothing. I just didn't know you w w were there. Well, I didn't know you were there until I took these books off the shelf. Then I saw you on the other side of the rack. <laughs> Do you like poetry, too? P -p poetry? Isn't there poetry on your side? Uh-uh. P -polit political philosophy. Oh, I see. But I'm all finished with what I came in here for. G goodbye, Mr. Fontaine. Wait a minute. You're in one of my classes, aren't you? Yes, Mr. Fontaine. Well, do you two know each other? Uh, oh, yes, Isabel. Uh, oh, <laughs> I uh, call Miss Palmer Isabel. I've uh, been good friends of hers for some time. <laughs> Margie's our champion debater. We're very proud of her. Why, she's the youngest student in her class. Well, that's fine. As a matter of fact, Margie, the principal asked me to be chairman of the next debate. That's Wednesday, isn't it? Y yes, Mr. Fontaine. Good. Well, if you excuse me now, I'm looking for a certain volume of Wordsworth. Why the long face, Margie? Why did you have to tell him that I'm a debater and, and younger than other people? And when a person meets another person for practically the first time, she doesn't want to be known as a debater and younger than other people. Oh, but I'm sure he'll appreciate your being so smart. Don't you think he's cute? I don't know. I don't generally notice how teachers look. Well, he is cute. Your books are on my desk, Margie. Good night, dear. Good night, Miss Palmer. I'm sure glad I waited for you, Margie. But I figured if I sat there long enough, you'd come out sometime. You're very nice to carry my books, Roy. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Say, when you came out of the library, who was that that opened the door for you? Mr. Fontaine, the new French teacher. What did he want? He merely happened to open the door for me. I don't trust Frenchmen. He isn't French. Well, then why does he teach it? Oh, Roy, sometimes you act just like... But that's Papa. Huh? Papa! 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 Oh, golly, that's awful. What's awful? Oh, that car that just went by. That was my father. I miss seeing him. You know, Margie, I've been to your house several times, and I've never met your father. Well, he... he doesn't live with us. Why doesn't he? I mean, are your folks divorced or something? Oh, of course not. My mother died when I was a baby, and ever since I've lived with my grandmother. Well, doesn't your grandmother like your father or something? Well, of course she does. It's only... Well, for goodness sake, Roy, I don't see how it's any of your business. Okay, okay. It's just that Papa was all broken up when my mother died, and, and he went away for, for a long time. And then when he came back, he just started living by himself. 
And it's better that way, too, because, well, after all, what does a businessman know about girls? Oh. Papa's a very wonderful man, and we're very fond of each other. And he has a terrific business, so we can't always see each other all the time, so we try to see each other on Wednesday afternoon. Oh. Of course, he pays for everything, but, well, I mean, Papa's a widower. Oh, yeah, he would be. I mean, if your mother... Yeah, of course, I see what you mean. Well, come on, Roy. I gotta get home sometime. Well, thanks a lot for walking home with me, Roy. I guess you better be going now. Goodbye. Oh, I'm in no hurry. Oh, well, uh, would you like to come in and say hello to my grandmother? Sure, why not? Okay, wait here on the porch a second. Pretty late, aren't you, Margie? I know, Grandma, but I couldn't help it. You see, I... I know. Maribel stopped in and told me all about it. I've told you a dozen times to fix those bloomers. Naturally, they fell down. Oh, Grandma, please. He's on the porch. Who's on the porch? You can come in, Roy. Hello, Mrs. McSweeney. Come on in, Roy, and sit down. Sit down. Thanks, Mrs. McSweeney. You know, I've always been meaning to ask you about your fireplace here in the living room. What's the matter with that fireplace? Oh, I don't mean the fireplace. I mean, that old lock and chain hanging up on the mantel here. Young man, I lashed myself to the railing of the White House with that lock and chain. It took four cops and a hacksaw to pry me loose. I spent two days in jail. Oh, gee whiz, what for? For a very noble cause. Oh, really, Grandma? I I don't think Mr. Hornsdale's very interested in politics. Then it's high time he took an interest. Young man, I was campaigning for the right of women to vote. They called us suffragettes. Oh, yeah, I read about that. My father says a woman's place is in the home. You tell your father to wake up. A woman's place is wherever she makes it. Now, I've raised Margie to take a deep interest in politics. And someday, I hope she'll be the first woman president of the United States. Oh. Grandma, please. A woman president couldn't be any worse than some of the men we've had. Well, Roy, uh... (laughs) I know you're in a hurry to get home. It's so frightfully late as it is. Well, goodbye, Roy. I'll see you tomorrow. Call on us again, young man. Yeah, well, goodbye, Mrs. McSweeney, Margie. I'm sorry you have to rush off. Oh, I don't have to go yet. But thanks again, Roy. Goodbye. Oh, Grandma. What's the matter with you? Don't you understand? I don't want to be the first woman president of the United States. For heaven's sakes, why not? Not even if you paid me. And I wish you wouldn't keep telling that to people. Oh, now, now, honey, what's wrong? Well, first, Miss Palmer tells people that I'm a debater and younger than other people. And then you have to go and tell Roy about that you were chained to the White House and sent to jail, and then about me being the first woman president. Oh, he'll probably never come back. I bet a cookie he phones you right after dinner. Do you think so? Grandma, in your opinion, is Roy's Adam's apple very noticeable? Why, no, dear. You're just being nice. You can't help noticing it, I guess. It hits you right in the eye. Oh, well, I guess Roy's better than nobody. Well, you wouldn't want a silly, vain, conceited boy like Johnny Green for a bow, would you? Johnny? Oh, yes. Yes, Grandma. I certainly would. Cynthia. Still working on that debate, Miss Margie, or are you just listening to that phonograph of yours? Oh, I'm working, Cynthia. Your grandma said the time you was in bed. Why are you waving your arms around like that for? I'm rehearsing my gestures. You ain't rehearsing, honey. You shadow boxing. Cynthia, do you know anything about Frenchmen? All I know is that they eat frog legs and snails. Oh, I'm sure Mr. Fontaine wouldn't eat snails. Oh, every girl in school's got a crush on him already. Including you. I've got more sense than to get a crush on a teacher. That chance I'd have anyway. Cynthia, do you think a woman could learn to love a man with an Adam's apple? Well, a friend of mine, her husband's got a guard and she's got seven kids. (laughs) Don't seem to trouble her none. Come over here to the window, Miss Margie. Look down there. What? Down on Mary Bell's porch. She and that raccoon coat boy. My, my, they the kissing this couple. Been at it most of the evening. 
I... I know. You've been peeking, too? Of course not. I only meant... Well, anyway, how can people waste their time like that? Why, I think it's disgusting. Mm-hmm. Well, good night, Miss Martin. Good night, Cynthia. It's really not so noticeable. Not when Roy wears a high collar. Oh, well. I'll be out in a sec, Roy. Look, Grandma, his father let Roy have their Model T today. Well, that's fine. Here you are, Margie, a spare handkerchief. Oh, I won't need one, Grandma. No, but Roy will. That boy always has the sniffles. Golly, I almost forgot. Huh? My ice skates. Everybody's going ice skating after the debate. Grandma, do you suppose... Do you suppose maybe Papa would come and hear me debate? I mean, it is Wednesday anyway, and all of the dean is going to the high school instead of here, and... He could hear me debate. I think it's a wonderful idea. Then ask him, Grandma. Call him now. I do nothing of the sort. You stop by his office and ask him yourself. Oh, but I, I don't think Papa likes me to stop in his office. He's always so busy. Oh, rubbish. Now you do as I say. Well, all right. And don't forget, Grandma, the high school auditorium at 3 o'clock. You're sure quiet, Margie. Golly, don't worry about your father. You left a message for him, didn't you? Yes. It wasn't his fault he wasn't in his office. Sure is funny, Margie. I never knew your father was an undertaker. He's a mortician. And and what's so funny about it? Oh, I just mean I didn't know he had his own funeral parlors here on Ridge Street. It's not what you meant at all. Well, I... Well, I, I'm sure it's a very interesting business. I'll bet it's a good business, too. I mean, well... Gee whiz, people are always dying. <clears throat> he can't help being in the business he's in. Oh, it's all right. I don't mind, honest. Yes, you do. Everybody minds. I mind. Oh, I'd give anything on earth if he was just a bricklayer or something. Do you suppose he'll come and hear you debate? How do I know? Papa can hardly plan anything. It's just like you said. People are always dying. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard Miss Margie McDuff, captain of the Central High debating team. The next speaker for the negative is Mr. Arnold Harrison of Polytechnic High School. Mr. Chairman, honorable judges, worthy opponents, and ladies and gentlemen, my worthy opponents, the Central High Orators, has spoken to you of the high cost of keeping the Marines in this... Boy, oh boy, Mary Bell, I've had about all of that I can stand. But where will we go, Johnny? Ice skating. Oh, but we can't. We're supposed to stay in the auditorium and listen. Not me. Anyway, the orchestra won't start at the skating rink until 4 o'clock. Well, we'll just stand here in the corridor then. If I go back in the auditorium, I'll fall asleep. Somebody's coming. I, uh, I beg your pardon. I, I beg your pardon. Is there a, uh, a debate going on in there? And how? Oh, thank you, young man. Thank you very much. Hey, can you imagine somebody wanting to hear that stuff? Johnny, do you know who that was? Who? Oh. Margie's father, Mr. Angus McDuff. He's an undertaker. Oh, poor Margie. A grandmother who's nuts and an undertaker for an old man. Oh, you. Of course not. Let me compare now the record of the Nicaraguan people during the ten years preceding the arrival of our Marines with the notable achievements since made in that troubled land. Why, as far back as 1900... And now, again in rebuttal, Miss Margie McDuff. Ladies and gentlemen, the strongest argument that our opponents have been able to advance this afternoon is that American occupation will raise the standard of living of the Nicaraguans and enable them to buy American plumbing. Ladies and gentlemen, would you turn in liberty for a bathtub? Would you? Where is the conscience and the heart of America? If we can say, give us liberty or give us death, then we have no right to tell the people of Nicaragua that they should take bathtubs instead of freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, we fought in 76, in 1860, and in 1918 to make the world safe for democracy 
and we'd do it again and again. Don't let us ever forget our brave past. Don't let the flag of the United States mean bathtubs and plumbing instead of liberty. I say to you, take the Marines out of Nicaragua and bring them home to defend liberty always, but never plumbing. <laughs> Thank you. Gosh, Margie, you are wonderful. Janie, he's here. My father's here. Where, Margie? Where? In the fourth row, with my grandma and, and, and Mr. Fontaine. Watching those children ice skate. I've a mind to rent a pair myself. <laughs> well, are you glad you came, Mr. Fontaine? I wouldn't have missed this for anything. And I might easily have, Mrs. McSweeney, if you hadn't introduced yourself at school. I had to introduce myself. Margie's got a crush on you. <laughs> well, Mr. McDuff, your daughter's almost as good a skater as she is a debater. You know, Margie would look awfully nice in a skating outfit like Mary Bell Tennis. Well, buy her one, Grandma. Buy her one. Just send me the bill. You approve of a young girl exposing her bare legs, Mr. Fontaine? I certainly do. Always keep in mind, Mrs. McSweeney, that I studied in Paris, France. She's right. She's right. The child is right. Agnes, what are you mumbling about? We should take the Marines out of Nicaragua. She's absolutely right. Yes, sir. I write my congressman about it. Might even send a telegram to Senator Whipple. Good. Why did we send the Marines down there in the first place? You tell me that, sir. You just tell me that. I, I'm sorry I'm such a terrible ice skater, Margie. Maybe when they play a slower tune, I'll do better. You're doing beautifully, Roy. Isn't it fun? No. Look. Look at Mary Bell and Johnny. Oh, they do skate divinely. Couple of show-offs. Gosh, Margie, that sure was a swell speech you made this afternoon. Oh, thank you, Roy. And you look, well, you look so... Sort of intense and full of fire. Golly, I did. Hi, Margie. Hello, Roy. Hello, Hi. Mary Bell. Isn't he a divine? Oh, hello, Johnny. Hi, McDuff. Well, I won't be long, Johnny. Where's she going? Oh, she's got to get another lace for her shoe. Well, just don't stand here, Johnny. Can't you see Margie wants you to skate with her? Oh, don't be silly, Roy. Well, he doesn't want to skate with me. Oh, I don't mind. Come on, McDuff. Why, why, Johnny. girl is right. Rank imperialism, that's what it is. Why don't we let the Nicaraguans mind their own business? Oh, forget it, Angus. Huh? Look at your daughter. She's skating with that Johnny Green. Ah, she's waving at us. Hi, Margie. You're doing fine. Wait a minute. They've stopped skating. Something's wrong with Margie. She's holding her stomach. I'll bet it was those hot dogs she and Roy were eating before. Oh, what's the matter, Margie? Are you sick? No. Just go away, Johnny, please. Well, if you don't feel good, you better hang on to me. Hey, hey, Mary Bell. I'm coming. I've got to sit down. Here? On the ice? I've got to. And go away. Well, gee whiz, okay. Mary Bell, stand in front of me. Oh, please. Margie, you're losing something. Look. I know. I never did fix them. What'll I do? Gosh, I don't know. Look, they're coming. Your grandma and your father and Mr. Fontaine. Mr. Fontaine, gee, are you lucky. Hey, what's happened? Is she badly hurt? Oh, it looks like something fell down. I, I mean, she okay. fell down, I guess. Oh, Margie, sit on him. Sit on him. I'm trying to. Oh. It's probably your ankle. P pardon me, Let please. Let me in there. Clear out of here, everybody. Go on. Shoot, shoot. Oh, my. It is my ankle. My ankle hurts. Well, I, I, I'll get a doctor. Just relax, Angus. I've got a muffler. I can bind her ankle temporarily, at least. Now, Margie, stop squirming. What are you looking for? Come here, Grandma. Well? Grandma. My bloomer. Your what? Grandma. Where are they? I'm sitting on them. I think. But if I get up... Well, for heaven's sake. Maybe while Daddy and Mr. Fontaine are fixing my ankle, I can sort of slip them into your coat. Well, hurry up. Get ready, Grandma. I... Grandma. They're gone. What is... What do you know? Angus, I think you and Mr. Fontaine better get a doctor after all. I'll stay right here with Margie while you talk. 
Johnny? Wasn't it awful? I can't figure out what happened to her, Mary Bell. She was skating fine, and all of a sudden, she kind of lost her equilibrium. You said it, Johnny. Her best embroidered ones, too. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return with Act Two of Margie. Meanwhile, here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter. What's our theme for tonight, Libby? I'd say it was romance, Mr. Keeley. Romance with a capital R. To be more specific, it's 20th Century Fox's new picture, The Foxes of Harrow, made from the recent best-selling novel. Ah, with Maureen O'Hara and Rex Harrison as the stars. Mm -hmm. I can't think of anyone who could bring a love story to the screen more vividly than those two. Wait till movie fans see Maureen O'Hara as a New Orleans belle of the days before the Civil War. The gorgeous costumes she wears are just right for her stately beauty. And Rex Harrison, as the dashing adventurer and gambler, is going to make feminine hearts flutter as never before. Well, Rex is a fine actor and certainly shows his versatility in The Foxes of Harrow. You know, he told me he'd had special coaching in fencing, jumping horses, singing and dancing, French and Irish dialects, and lessons in how to do card tricks. That's an assignment for even the most experienced actor, don't you think, John Kennedy? I should say so, Libby. But there's one thing I'll bet Rex needed no special coaching for. Oh, what's that, John? Making love to Maureen O'Hara. <laughs> <laughs> no, Maureen's beauty would be inspiration enough. She's one of our loveliest Lux girls, isn't she? With her fresh, vivid coloring and soft, smooth skin, she certainly is. Maureen found time during the shooting of the picture to entertain the president of her largest fan club at lunch in the studio commissary. She invited me to come, too. Her young guest was thrilled with Maureen's charm and asked lots of questions. When the talk got around to beauty care, Maureen had some sound advice for the girls of her fan club. My complexion care is very simple, she said. Just daily beauty facials with Lux toilet soap. They give my skin exactly the care it needs. Nine out of ten famous and beautiful stars agree on that, Libby. And no wonder. Screen stars must have a complexion care that works. I think any woman who uses Lux toilet soap for a while will be delighted with the fresh new loveliness it gives her skin. I'm sure she would, Libby. So here is a message to other women. Begin tomorrow to use this gentle, effective care screen stars recommend. Remember, Lux toilet soap is Hollywood's own beauty soap. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. We continue with the second act of Margie, starring Jean Crane in the title role and Glenn Langan as Mr. Fontaine. Well, let's leave 1928 for a brief moment and return to the attic in the pleasant little house where the young Bobby Soxer continues to press her mother for the secrets of her youth. Holy cow, Mother. You mean to say you lost your bloomers in front of all those people at the skating rink? <laughs> I'm afraid I did, darling. But I was hoping desperately that no one besides Grandma and Mary Bell knew the awful truth. The others had a vague idea that I'd sprained my ankle or something. Apart from the bloomers, I'd had a very happy day. Certainly have had a big day. Oh, a wonderful day, Grandma. Call losing your best bloomers wonderful? Golly, no. But I did get to skate with Johnny Green. And Papa came to the debate and Mr. Fontaine. And Papa stayed for dinner and kissed me goodnight twice. I'm afraid you thought your father all worked up over Nicaragua. <laughs> he seemed very interested. I still wonder what happened to your bloomers. They couldn't have just walked away. Oh, Grandma, please, let's not talk about it. I'll never be able to face anyone again. Now, who on well, earth? could it be Roy? Or maybe it's just Mary Bell. Who is it, Cynthia? It's that fashion business, Sweeney. It's Mr. Fontaine. <gasps> oh, no. No, Grandma. Just look at me in my bathrobe. Well, come on in, Mr. Fontaine. But I'll bet he saw. I mean, this afternoon, my... Well, how nice of you to stop by. Good evening, Mrs. McSweeney. Hello, Margie. I, uh... Happened to be taking a walk in the neighborhood. I often take a walk after dinner, and it occurred to me to drop in and see how the invalid was getting along. <laughs> well, how is your ankle, Margie? Oh, it's f f fine. It, it hardly hurts at all. Well, I'm delighted, after all, to be certainly ashamed not to be able to go to the prom next week because of a sprained ankle. 
Have a chair, Mr. Fontaine. Thank you. <laughs> Margie, if your foot's really better, why don't you go to your room and get Mr. Fontaine's muffler? Oh, yes. It was really very nice of you to bind my ankle with your lovely muffler, Mr. Fontaine. Well, get it. That's probably what he stopped by for. Oh, Margie, uh, just a minute. Here. A package for me? Yes, in the excitement this afternoon, I... I believe you lost your handkerchief. <laughs> oh. I, I, I'll get your m m muffler. A handkerchief, Mr. Fontaine? Mm, well. <laughs> that was very tactful, thank you. Remember, Mrs. McSweeney, I studied in Paris, France. <laughs> Margie? Hey, Margie. Oh, hello, Mary Bell. I just saw the light go on in your room. What did Mr. Fontaine want? That was him, wasn't it? Oh, he, uh, he just came to call on me. But aren't you excited? I mean, gosh, Mr. Fontaine, did you know he was coming? Well, naturally. People don't let people call on people unless they have permission. Did he bring you anything? I mean, candy or, or flowers? Oh, yes, he, uh, he brought me a lovely gift. Margie, what? Mary Bell, when, when a person receives an intimate gift from a gentleman friend, she doesn't go around blabbing about what it is. Intimate? What do you mean? What did he bring you? Oh, something. Margie, do you suppose Mr. Fontaine is going to invite you to the prom? The prom? Well, I, I really don't know what Mr. Fontaine's motives are. Excuse me, Mary Bell. Men hate to be kept waiting, you know. The prom. Oh, as if anyone else had asked me about Roy Hornsdale. But what if he does? Oh, Mr. Fontaine. Oh, gosh. Margie? I'm coming, Grandma. Take it easy. Mr. Fontaine just left. He said you can bring his muffler to school tomorrow. Margie? Did you hear me? Yes, Grandma. I heard. <laughs> Margie, why aren't you dressed? Didn't you tell me the prom starts at 8.30? I'm not going to the prom, Grandma. That was Roy on the phone just now. He's got the sniffles again. He wants his tonsils, too. His folks won't let him go. Oh, it doesn't matter. I just as soon stay home. Well, Mary Bell's going to the prom with Johnny. I'm sure they'd be glad to take you along. Without an escort? I'd rather die. Besides, Johnny doesn't like me tagging you along even to come home from school. Look out the window. She's coming here. Who? Mary Bell. Margie, 20 years from now, you look at Johnny Green and you wonder what you ever saw in him. 20 years from now, I'll be an old woman and it won't matter. I'm coming, Mary Bell. She'll just gloat over you. Don't you dare tell her what happened to Roy. Well, it's true, isn't it? You could pretend, couldn't you? Hello, Mary Bell. Margie, I just simply had to come over. Look, Johnny sent them. Imagine two orchids. Oh, uh, hello, Mrs. McSweeney. Hello, you flapper. Oh. <laughs> orchids. Well, uh, I suppose you'll be going with Roy, huh? No, his cold's worse. Oh, Margie. But I'm still going. You are? But who with? Oh, you'll find out. Margie McDuff, I bet you've been holding out on me right along. But it couldn't be, not with him. Not with Mr. Fontaine. They, they say Frenchmen dance very well. Oh, gosh. Well, I, I really better get back. I'm going to take a bubble bath in a simply terrific perfume I have, which absolutely is guaranteed to intoxicate men by its fragrance. <coughs> Goodbye, Margie. Goodbye, Mary Bell. Mr. Fontaine. Gosh. I'm going up to my room, Grandma. Yes, dear. I'll uh, get the phone. Hello? Hello? Uh, hello, Grandma. Uh, this is Angus. I, uh, I hope I didn't disturb anybody. Angus McDuff, you don't have to apologize to call up here. What's on your mind? Why, wh why not a thing, Grandma, not a thing. I, uh, just wondering how everyone is. Say, ho hold the line a second. Margie! Margie! I just wanted to be sure the coast was clear, Angus. Uh, what do you mean, Grandma? Oh, oh, uh, incidentally... You'll be very interested to know I just threw a salesman out of my office. You did? Why? Tried to sell me a gross of hand-dipped candles made in Nicaragua. Oh, I told him a thing or two. Made it the point of our bayonets, I told him. Don't talk to me about...
about candles, I said, until you can bring me word that our Marines have been withdrawn, sir. Were the candles any good? Well, what do I care? Nothing is good, madam, if it betrays the heart and conscience of America. Angus, have you got anything special to do tonight? We Americans fought in 76. In... Uh, what do you mean, have I anything to do? Well, have you? Well, uh, Mr. Van Buren of the Forest Acres Mortician Service was coming over to discuss a merger of our interests. Well, how about merging your interests with Margie's? Huh? Angus, she's had her heart set on going to the high school prom tonight. Only this boy she was going with can't make it. Well, that's a little out of my line, Grandma. I, uh, haven't danced in 20 years. Who cares? Well, I could see Van Buren on Monday. Good. Now, don't be later than 8 o'clock, and don't you dare show up without a corsage. Uh, Margie likes uh, gardenias, doesn't she? Gardenias, my foot. Orchids. Three orchids. <laughs> yes, Grandma. Eight o'clock with three orchids. Thanks, Angus. Goodbye. Margie! Margie! Come down here. I've got news for you. But I think you understand, Grandma. Who's coming to take me to the prom? Now, stop asking questions and get into your formal. Grandma, if you call someone and made him take me, I'll never forgive you. He called me. He's a great admirer of yours. It's not Joe Kelly, Grandma. He's only 15 and his hands are always clammy. He's much older than 15. And his hands are not clammy. Grandma, do you remember that bubble bath I gave you for Christmas? Of course. Would you let me use a little? Mary Bell's taking a bubble bath and she says it simply intoxicates men with its exotic fragrance. And, and so I thought Well, that... help yourself, honey. Well, hurry up. If you don't hold still, Miss Margie, I'll never get you hooked up. Oh, I'm sorry, Cynthia. Grandma, do you think I look sophisticated? Well, yes, for your age. D -d Doorbell. I'll go down. Grandma, who is it? You've simply got to tell me. You'll find out. He's on time anyway. Don't worry, honey. As soon as she's downstairs, I'll go down too and take a peek. And I'll tell you who it is. Well, this is a surprise. I hope you'll excuse me, but I, I was driving by, so I... Well, you look very nice in your tuxedo, Mr. Fontaine. And that corsage is lovely. <laughs> I, I'm about to call for Mrs. Palmer. You know, the school librarian. I'm taking her to the prom tonight. I uh, thought I'd leave this for Margie. It's her French theme. She was anxious to know what grade I'd given her. What grade did you give her? Hey, of course. You know, Margie's an exceptionally bright child, Mrs. McSweeney. An enchanting child, I might add. Child, indeed. I doubt if you're eight years older. Well, frankly, I did lie a little bit about my age to get on the faculty here. Well, I suppose Margie's going to the prom. Who's taking her? Her father. Oh? Well, just between us, I wish I were. You know, it's a very strange thing. I've never seen a girl... Tell Miss Margie, that Frenchman, my, my, and he's, he dressed up, and with flowers, too. But it can't be, Mr. Fontaine, or Cynthia... Do you suppose Grandma bribed him to take me on account of I didn't have anyone else? He don't need no bribe, honey. He's a young man, ain't he? And you're a pretty girl, ain't you? Child, I've been telling you that all along. Do you really think he likes me? Oh, I've had a crush on him ever since the day he came to Central High. My diary's simply full of him, Cynthia. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like a two-way crush to me, honey. Now, go on, get on there. Go on, get Good evening. How pretty you look. Oh, thank you. And you look very pretty, too. I mean, you look... Excuse me, telephone. Oh, what a beautiful corsage. Why, how perfectly lovely of you to bring me flowers. <laughs> well, Margie, I... I, I oh, be... they're just beautiful. Uh, Margie, this French theme of yours, I, I, I thought that perhaps you... Well, Margie... That... For you, Margie, it's Helen Day. Excuse me a second, Mr. Fontaine. Oh, I know I'm going to wake up and find this is all just a dream. Uh, Margie, you don't understand. Hello, Helen. This is McSweeney. You don't have to tell me, I know. She thinks you're taking her. But what am I going to do? Well, it's all my fault. We've simply got to think of something. And mine are camellias, Helen. Oh, they're simply gorgeous. Look, Helen, I have to fly now. Mr. Fontaine's waiting for me. Uh, okay, I'll see you at the prom. Goodbye. Helen thought I couldn't go to the prom on account of Roy's tonsils, Mr. Fontaine. But when I told her you were taking me, why, she was just, just speechless. Oh, this card, this card on my corsage. I'm going to put this card in my scrapbook and keep it forever. Why, I'll even... The card.
card. It says, Miss Palmer. I'm sorry, Margie. That's what I was trying to explain to you. You see, I, I stopped by merely to bring you your French theme. It, it's excellent. Thank you. Margie. Let her go. Oh, this is terrible. Uh, look, I'll call Miss Palmer up and explain. She'll understand. No, now you just run along, Mr. Fontaine. Margie wouldn't go with you now in a million years. Margie? Hey, Margie. Margie. Hello, Mary Bell. Margie, Helen just phoned and said Mr. Fontaine was over at your house now. Oh, absolutely. He's here. Well, aren't you thrilled to death? Margie, listen. Why don't you and Mr. Fontaine sit with us tonight? Well, it, it's okay by me, but he's probably made other, other arrangements. Well, go down and ask him. He won't mind just so he's sitting next to you. Gosh, Margie, how'd you ever do it? Oh, honestly, Mary Bell, you're so funny. What? You're so gullible, just as bad as Helen. She fell for it, too. Fell for what? Oh, honestly, it's just a scream. Well, I'm not going with Mr. Fontaine. I just pretended he was taking me just for, just for fun. Oh, you don't really think I'd be seen at a, at a prom with a teacher, do you? But didn't he bring you a corsage? Helen said that. Oh, that was absolutely priceless. Well, I pretended to think they were for me, just to just to see what he would do. And he was so fussed and so embarrassed that it was all I could do to keep... to keep... to, to keep from bursting out laughing. Honestly, Mary Bell, he was a scream. Margie. Margie McDuff. I... I just don't understand you. Oh, I wish I were dead. I wish I were dead. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a moment, we'll return with Act Three of Margie. Tonight's guest is the young 20th century Fox starlet, Randy Stewart, lovely representative of her home state of Kansas. Well, I wasn't in Kansas long, Mr. Keeley. My folks were in show business. Most of my childhood was spent traveling with them. You started acting in stock at the age of three, didn't you, Randy? That's right. Then turned to radio and finally pictures. Well, you have an excellent background for the screen. And they tell me at 20th Century Fox that you're one of their most promising young players. Well, they've given me every chance to learn. Watching an actress like Betty Grable is an education in itself. I've spent every moment I could on the set of Mother Wore Tights. Then you've seen Betty in her most important role to date. She and Dan Daly make a great team of lovable stage hoofers in Mother Wore Tights. Mm, they're two of the smoothest dancers I ever saw. And Betty's part as the mother gives her dramatic talents full play. Oh, and isn't her wardrobe really spectacular? Just dozens of different costumes and hairstyles. All greatly enhanced by Technicolor. Yes, and that brings up a point of special interest to you, Mr. Kennedy. What's that, Miss Stewart? Well, I was in Miss Grable's dressing room one day watching her put on her makeup. And it took an unusually short while because of her very fair, smooth skin. Well, Miss Stewart, any girl who uses Lux toilet soap isn't likely to have makeup problems. And true as can be, Mr. Kennedy. Betty Grable told me that daily Lux soap facials kept her skin just the way she likes it. My, I'm glad I found out about Lux soap care long ago. Nice skin is so important for picture close-ups. I'd say lovely skin was important in real-life close-ups, too, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, rather. I wish every girl could find out for herself how easy and effective Lux soap care can be. Why not tell our audience how you take your beauty facials, Miss Stewart? Well, I, I just smooth on the Lux soap lather well in... Rinse with warm water and then cold and pat dry with a soft towel. That rich, creamy lather leaves skin so fresh. Lux Soap Care does make skin softer, smoother. Tests made by skin specialists showed three out of four complexions improved in a short time. Thanks and good luck to you, Miss Randy Stewart. I hope every woman who wants a lovelier complexion will take your beauty hint and get some fragrant white Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow. Here's your producer... William Keeley. 
Our curtain rises on Act Three of Margie, starring Jean Crane as the lady in question and Glenn Langan as Mr. Fontaine. Once again, we swing briefly back to the present, where, upstairs in the attic, mother and daughter comb through the events of 20 years ago. From the album of photographs, Joyce has just taken a picture. Her mother smiles reflectively as she looks at it. Yes, Joyce. This is a picture of the 1928 high school prom. Oh, and you're not even there. Oh, gee, what an awful break, not being able to go to the prom. Oh, but I did go. And there's my picture. See? That's you? Golly. But who brought you? Well, about ten minutes after Mr. Fontaine had left the house, two other gentlemen arrived on our front porch. One of them was Roy Hornsey. Well, it's you, Mr. McDuff. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, young man. Good evening. Gosh, is that your car? That log limousine? It's one of my cars, yes. Gosh. How come you're calling her Margie on Saturday? A man does not call on his daughter. Oh, Margie says you always call Wednesdays. Uh, you bringing her flowers? Yes. Hey, you're not bringing her flowers left over from a... from a... <laughs> Young man, they have an expression in Nicaragua that very aptly describes a person of your ill manners. It goes... Oh, what am I wasting my time talking to you for? Who are you, anyway? I'm Roy Hornsdale. <laughs> He was, Mr. McDuff. Don't you remember me? I, I was at the skating rink the afternoon Margie hurt her ankle. Oh. Hasn't she told you about me? No. And either you ring that doorbell or let me. Oh, she's a wonderful girl, Mr. McDuff. I'm well aware of that fact. I was supposed to take her to the prom tonight, but... <laughs> I got a cold. Then go to bed. <laughs> My folks said I could come over as long as we didn't go out and I kept warm. Does anyone believe in coming in? What is this, a convention? Oh, hello, Grandma. What are you doing here, Roy? Uh, good evening, Mrs. McSweeney. I figured since Margie's not going to the prom and that And what I... makes you think she's not going to the prom? Huh? Cynthia? Take Roy into the kitchen and get him some hot milk or something. Milk? Milk? Get in here, Mr. Hornsdale. Margie, he's here, honey. Now, listen, Angus, I should explain, but I haven't got time. Margie's been crying. Now, don't ask why. Just be very tactful. Tactful? Did that sniveling boy in there make her cry? Oh, no. Roy's quite innocent. Oh. Hello, Papa. Margie. Well, come on down, my dear. Oh, you look beautiful. Simply beautiful. Oh, thank you. Papa, you're all dressed up. Well, you wouldn't want him to go to the prom in a business suit, would you? He's taking you. That was the big surprise. Honestly, Papa, you're taking me... Are, are you sure you want to? Honey, I've waited over 16 years for the privilege. Here. Orchids. Papa, three orchids. Well, I, I hope you won't be disappointed, Margie. I, I'm not a very good dancer. Oh, Papa, I'd rather be going to the dance with you than anyone else in the whole world. Excuse me while I get my coat, Papa. Well, Angus, what are you thinking? I was thinking, Grandma, that my daughter is just as pretty and... Every bit as sweet as yours ever was. I'm ready, Papa. Good night, Grandma. Good night, dear. She whiz, is Margie going out? She's gone out. Oh, gee whiz, I came here to read poetry to her. <laughs> Who am I going to read poetry to now? Cynthia? <laughs> Not to me, Mr. Hornsdale, and finish your milk. <laughs> It's Margie and her father. How you've changed, Mr. Fontaine. I beg your pardon? Come on, Papa. Did you see him, Johnny? Her father. Oh, but I want to explain what happened tonight. It doesn't matter, honey. Whatever happened was a wonderful break for me. Now, let's see if we can find a tape. But how come Margie came with her old man? Why, I suppose she wanted to be sure of dancing with someone, Johnny. Hey, come to think of it, uh, it's the first time I've ever seen Margie. Huh? 
Now, just what does that mean? I, uh, I don't know. Baby. Is this table all right, Papa? Are you sure? Oh, this is fine, dear, fine. I, I'll get some refreshments. Good and... evening, Margie. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Palmer. Good evening, Margie. Evening, Mr. McDuff. Nice party, isn't it? Oh, oh, yes, yes. Yes, indeed. Who is that with Mr. Fontaine? Miss Palmer, our our librarian. Oh, very attractive. She's well preserved for her age. Uh, Margie. That's uh that's a waltz they're playing. Uh, yes, Papa. Shall we try it? Oh, I'd love to. Papa. You know, this is the first time that you've ever danced with me. Second time. When? When you were about three months old. I, uh, I beg your pardon, but uh, may I cut in, sir? Well, uh, well, by all means, young man. Uh, by all means. Johnny. Well, you sure had them all fooled, Margie. They thought you were coming with Mr. Fontaine. Why, why, how absurd. Yeah, that's what I told them. I said, why would she want to come with some drip from the faculty when you... May I cut in? Oh, for, for Pete's sake, where did you come from? May I? Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, well, see you later, Margie. Thanks, Johnny. Not even one little smile, Margie? I, I don't feel like smiling. Why? Oh, I made such a fool of myself. You're just trying to be nice. You don't have to dance with me. Between you and me, Margie... I'd rather dance with you than anyone else in this room. If you only knew how I feel, if you... What did you say? I said I'd rather dance with you than anyone else in this room, and I meant it. Anyone? Anyone. Oh. Look, Maribel, Margie's doing all right. Oh, it's just a wall. Who wants to walk? Besides, he's just taking pity on her, like, like Johnny did. Oh, I sure wish Mr. Fontaine would take pity on me. I... Well, what do you know? Johnny's taking pity on her again. Hmm? <laughs> I did it to you, Johnny. I guess you can do it to me. I, I didn't think I'd see you so soon, Johnny. Hey, gee whiz, Margie. Where you been all my life? Right under your nose, I guess. Hey, you're sure a smooth dancer. Um, how about doing this more often? Well, I, I think that would be just one... One... Oh, no! Margie! What's the matter? What's wrong? Oh, no. No. Not tonight. Margie, you look... You look so funny. You're, you're not gonna faint, are you? That's... That's a very good idea. Margie! <laughs> Well, Joyce, that was the last time I ever wore bloomers. I was about to throw them away a few years ago, but your father insisted I keep them. Oh, Mother, to think that it happened again at the prom. Oh, how perfectly ghastly it must have been for you. Oh, it was, darling, ghastly. But what happened? Who finally got to take you home? Grandpa or who? Why, your father, of course. Hey, where is everybody? We're up here, Daddy, in the attic. Hello, funny face. Hello, Daddy. Hello, sweet. Well, what have you two been doing up here, hmm? oh, We've had more fun, Daddy. Mother's been telling me all about the bow she had when she went to Central High School. Oh, she has, has she? Look at this snapshot of Johnny Green. Mm. Oh, he sounds simply terrific. Do you remember it? Yes, dear. He was a drip. A drip of the first water. Mmm, Ralph, dear, and that doesn't sound so well coming from the principal of Central High School. You heard me. I said drip, darling. But where is he now? What does he do? He's a plumber. <laughs> He lives over in Glenley, I think. He works for a fellow named Roy Hornsdale. You don't say. Mm. Oh, look, Daddy, all these old phonograph records. Listen to this one. How about it, Daddy? Can you jive? Well, I can't exactly say I'm good at it, but I'd sure like to try. And here we go. Hey, hey take it easy. <laughs> Where's Papa, darling? Didn't he come home with you? No, he was detained. The ambassador will be home for dinner, though. Ambassador? 
You mean he got it? Take a look at the evening paper. I put it right there in the trunk. Angus McDuff appointed new ambassador to Nicaragua. Well, I'll be darned. so ends the story of Margie. And for their excellent performances, our thanks to Jean Crane and Glenn Langan, who returned to the footlights for a bow. Jean, since your last appearance on this stage, your chief production has been young Paul Jr. All our heartiest congratulations. Oh, thanks, Mr. Keeley. Is it your first baby, Jean? Oh, yes, of course. Why? Well, well with things the way they are now, it's a wonder you can get a new one without turning in the old one. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that young man keeps you pretty busy, Jean. Oh, I should say he does. With bottles to sterilize and formulas to mix, I never get a chance to do much else. Oh, Jean, it's a shame to blame that on the baby. Oh, we're used to pinning things on the baby. <laughs> I can well imagine. And I hope, Jean, you're starting him off in life with a proper appreciation of Lux toilet soap. That isn't hard at all, Mr. Keeley. Lux is the only toilet soap in our home, and I love it for complexion care. Well, if your new home matches that complexion, Jean, it must be very pleasant indeed. Thanks, Glenn. But seriously, it is. It's the first house of my own I've ever had, and I'm really crazy about it. It hasn't a single flaw. No flaw? What do you walk on? <laughs> oh, Glenn. <laughs> Well, it, it sounds as if Jean were walking on air these days. A new home, a new baby. Do you do your own housekeeping, Jean? I do the cooking, Mr. Keeley. Come up sometime and I'll serve you both a meal. Well, <laughs> speaking of cooking, what are you serving up next week on Lux, Mr. Keeley? Well, next Monday night we bring our audience a thrilling, romantic, and suspenseful drama. J. Arthur Rank's production, The Seventh Veil. And our stars are two great favorites of this theater. Joseph Cotton, and Ida Lupino. The story of a talented and lovely woman in the shadow of a strange spell, The Seventh Veil is a tempestuous drama of love and emotion building to a startling climax. Oh, that ought to make a great play for your listeners, Mr. Keeley. Good night. Good, Good night. night, and all our thanks for Margie. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Joseph Cotton and Ida Lupino in The Seventh Veil. Vale. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Jean Crane and Glenn Langan appeared by arrangement with 20th Century Fox, producers of Nightmare Alley and Kiss of Death. Barbara Lawrence will soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox production Captain from Castile. Heard in our cast tonight were Bill Johnstone as Macduff, Gil Stratton Jr. as Roy, and Clark Gordon, Francis Robinson, Mary Lou Harrington, Lillian Randolph, William Roy, and Julie Bennett. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is rebroadcast to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Seventh Veil vale with Joseph Cotton and Ida Lupino. Spry. When you bake and fry. Spry. Pour your cake and pie. Spry. Get your shortening by. Rely on Spry. Yes, it's Spry for pastry so tender, flaky, nut sweet, any pie filling tastes more delicious. You'll say pastry is extra delicate, better tasting with Spry. Rely on Spry. It's P R Y. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Seventh Veil vale with Joseph Cotton and Ida Lupino. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.